thank you. You know, I almost didn't make it because this morning, uh, I happen to be the director of the Hutchins Center at uh, Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard. It's my day job. And um, <clears throat> Glenn Hutchins is one of the owners of the Celtics. And the first night of the playoff, the next round of the playoff, happens tonight, in fact, at 7.30. And when I woke up, there was an email from my friend Glenn saying that he had an extra seat courtside. So for a second, I was going to call in sick Adam until I realized that a million people would see me in the middle of the, the court, <laughs> since these seats are right by the, the opponent's uh, bench. And whenever I go with him, you get texts all a game. Is that you? Is that you? I go, yes, that's me. That's me. I thought I would talk about I'll give you one example. Uh, I, my, again, my day job, I have a PhD in English literature, and I, I teach literature. That's what I was trained to do. Um, what makes for a literary tradition? Why is, can Farah and I um, say that there is an African-American literary tradition? Is it because the writers are all black? Well, that doesn't seem to be a sufficient definition. What if there were a formal principle that connects texts in a, into a tradition? so that there is a process of reading and revision, like links in a chain, a chain of signification. And I want to give you an example of how one of them works. Um, probably the most famous paragraph in the history of African American literature was published in 1903 by the great W.E.B. Du Bois, first black man to get a PhD from Harvard University in 1895. And in The Souls of Black Folk, the Bible for black intellectuals, he says, after the Egyptian and the Indian, the Greek and the Roman, the Teuton and the Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others of measuring one soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his tunis, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. Now, obviously, for Du Bois, this double consciousness um, is a problem, right? And it's a problem that's produced by Jim Crow segregation. Remember, he publishes this in 1903. So the cure for Du Bois would be the cure for this double consciousness, this sense of alienation from oneself, if you're black, will be the end of segregation. Funny thing happens in the life of a trope. It goes where it wants to go. For subsequent black writers, particularly the one that I'm featuring tonight, Zora Neale Hurston, the um, trope of double consciousness is not a problem, but a solution. She realized that what Du Bois was describing was the condition of modernity itself that we all, have more, we all have multiple identities. And the key was to learn how to name one's multiple identities and then to move seamlessly between one's multiple identities. And Hurston uses this as a structuring principle for her great novel, Their Eyes Are Watching God, which is about the liberation of a woman who's being oppressed by a series of men. So I'm going to let her explain to you how she flips Du Bois's trope upside down, and we're going to walk with Janie while she frees herself. You show loves to tell me what to do, but I can't tell you nothing I see. That's because you need telling, her husband rejoined hotly. It would be pitiful if I didn't. Somebody got to think for women and chicken, chillin' and chickens and cows. I, God, they sure don't think none themselves. I know a few things that women folks think sometimes, too. Oh, no, they don't, her husband said. They just think they're thinking. When I see one thing, I understand it's 10. You see 10 things, and you don't understand one. 
Time and scenes like that put Janie to thinking about the inside state of her marriage. Time came when she fought back with her tongue as best she could. But it didn't do her any good. It just made Joe, her husband, do more. He wanted her submission, and he'd keep on fighting until he felt he had it. So gradually, Janie pressed her teeth together and learned to hush. The spirit of the marriage left the bedroom and took to living in the parlor. It was there to shake hands whenever company came to visit, but it never went back inside the bedroom again. So she put something in there to represent the spirit like a Virgin Mary image of a church. The bed was no longer a daisy field for her and Joe to play in. It was a place where she went and laid down when she was sleepy and tired. She wasn't pedal open anymore with him. She was 24 and seven years married when she knew. She found that out one day when he slapped her face in the kitchen. It happened over one of those dinners that chase in all women sometimes. They plan and they fix and they do, and then some kitchen dwelling fiend slips a squatchy, soggy, tasteless mess into their pots and pans. Janie was a good cook, and Joe had looked forward to his dinner as a refuge from other things. So when the bread didn't rise, and the fish wasn't quite done at the bone, and the rice was scorched, he slapped Janie until she had a ringing sound in her ears and told her about her brains before he stalked on back to the store. Janie stood where he left her for unmeasured time and thought. She stood there until something fell off the shelf inside her. Then she went inside there to see what it was. It was her image of Jody tumbled down and shattered. But looking at it, she saw that it never was the flesh and blood figure of her dreams, just something she had grabbed up to drape her dreams over. In a way, she turned her back upon the image where it lay and looked further. She had no more blossoming openings dusting pollen over her man, neither any glistening young fruit where the petals used to be. She found that she had a host of thoughts that she would never expressed to him and numerous emotions she had never let Jody know about things packed up and put away in parts of her heart where he could never find them. She was saving up feelings for some man she had never seen. She had an inside and an outside now, and suddenly she knew how not to mix them. She bathed, the baptism scene for a new birth. She bathed and put on a fresh dress and head kerchief and went on to the store before Jody had time to send for her. That was a bow to the outside of things. So now she can navigate and move seamlessly between these selves, the inside and the outside. And this, Max is a killer. This is how she slays the man who has been oppressing her and finds her liberation. And then I will be done. It got to be terrible in the store. The more his back ached and his muscle dissolved into fat and the fat melted off his bones, the more fractious he became with Janie, especially in the store. The more people in there, the more ridicule he poured over her body to point attention away from his own. And so one day, Steve Bixon wanted some chewing tobacco and Janie cut it wrong. She hated that tobacco knife anyway. It worked very stiff. She fumbled with the thing and cut away from the mark. Mixon didn't mind. He held it up for a joke to tease Janie a little. Look here, Brother Mayor, what your wife done took and done. It was cut comical. So everybody laughed at it. A woman and a knife, no kind of knife, don't belong together. <laughs> there was some more good-natured laughter at the expense of women. Jody didn't laugh. He hurried across from the post office side and took the plug of tobacco away from Mixon and cut it again, cut it exactly on the mark and glared at Janie. I, God Almighty, a woman stay around the store till she gets old as Methuselah and still can't cut a little thing like a plug of tobacco. Don't stand there rolling your Popeyes at me with your rump hanging nearly to your knees. A big laugh started out in the store, but people got to thinking and stopped. It was funny if you looked at it right quick, but it got pitiful if you thought about it a while. It was like somebody snatched off a part of a, woman, a woman's clothes while she wasn't looking and the streets were crowded. And then too, Janie took the middle of the floor to talk right into Jody's face. And that was something that she hadn't done before. Stop mixing up my doings with my looks, Jody. When you get through telling me how to cut a plug of tobacco, then you can tell me whether my behind is on straight or not. What? 
what's that you say, Janie? You must be out of your head. No, I ain't out, out of my head neither. You must be talking such language as that. You the one started talking under people's clothes, not me. What's the matter with you know-how? You ain't no young girl to be getting all insulted about your looks. You ain't no young court and gal. You're an old woman, nearly 40. <laughs> yeah, Janie says, I'm nearly 40 and you's already 50. How come you can't talk about that sometimes instead of always pointing at me? Tain't no use in getting all mad, Janie, because I mentioned you ain't no young gal no more. Nobody in here ain't looking for no wife out of you, old as you is. No, I ain't no young gal no more, but then I ain't no old woman neither. And I reckon I looks my age too. But I'm a woman every inch of me, and I know it. That's a, hot, that's a whole lot more than you could say. You big bellies around here and put out a lot of brag, but tain't nothing to it but your big voice. Huh, talking about me looking old, when you pull down your britches, you look like the change of life. <laughs> Great God from Zion, Sam Watson gasped. Y'all really playing the dozens tonight. Well, what's that you say? Joe challenged, hoping his ears had fooled him. And in the greatest synesthesia in the history of African-American literature, Walter says, you heard her, you ain't blind. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be shot with tax than to hear that about myself, <laughs> lies Moss commiserated. Then Joe Starks, Joe Starks realized all the meanings and his vanity bled like a flood. Janie had robbed him of his illusion of irresistible maleness that all men cherish, which was terrible. The thing that Saul's daughter had got done to David. But Janie had done worse. He had cast down his empty armor before men and they had laughed, would keep on laughing when he paraded his possessions hereafter they would not consider the two together. They'd look with envy at the things and pity the man that owned those things. When he said in judgment it would be the same, good for nothings like Dave and Lum and Jim wouldn't change place with him. For what can excuse a man in the eyes of other men for lack of courage, lack of strength? Raggedy behind squirts of 16 and 17 would be giving him their merciless pity out of their eyes while their mouths said something humble. There was nothing to do in life anymore. Ambitious, ambition was useless. And the cruel deceit of Janie, making all that show of humbleness and scorning him all the time, laughing at him and now putting the town up to do the same. Joe, Tar Joe Starks didn't know the words for all this, but he knew the feeling. So he struck Janie with all his might and drove her from the store. Thank you very much. Thank you.